Okay, members, we'll get started. Um, we're actually, I, I, sorry, I got it wrong. Um, we'd missed one report, and that's um, item nine, page 68, So, um, which is the Productivity Commission's uh, local government funding and financing inquiry. So we'll go to that now. Um, I'll move it, and seconded by Councillor James. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, Councillor Angela. Yay. Okay. Um, look, I, who's leading up this one? Um, the reason I didn't provide some feedback the other, we took this to a briefing, didn't we? So I, I want to do it now is because um, there was little time to speak. So I wonder if, and I raised it at the roadshow that they did, and um, Hauraki District Council did as well. So I wonder if you would consider us. Uh, Actually, do we have time? Because I know we're already overdue. Um, looking at the affordability of ratepayers and their ability to pay, I raised it, and the commissioner there, um, who was the chair, was interested in that. And around, uh, you know, our local government act instructs us to uh, take into regard the afford affordability of ratepayers when we're setting rates, but they don't give us an idea of how to measure that. There's no guidance in there. So I just wondered what your view was on that. If that's if, if it's possible to put some commentary in the submission on that. Um, thank you, Councillor Leary. Um, we certainly can, can, can add to the submission. Um, so we've signalled that to the Commission. I think our ability to go and do a whole lot of work at this time would be limited. Yeah. However, what we could do yeah. is, is identify that that's an area where we would where we would like them to do some more work. Okay. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, the second issue that I raised at that um, road show was I thought that their discussion paper touched quite lightly on uh, their uh, le uh, legislation driving costs downward to us. Um, in an example that. I discussed with the commissioner, the chair of the commission offline was like the local alcohol policy and the cost, the significant cost that that, dr that drove to us and of course Christchurch City Council, which was a million dollars and then they had to abandon it. So again, perhaps, um, you know, this is all about funding and financing for local government. I'm not expecting you to do a considerable amount of work, but some commentary into there's got to be a better way when they're passing down this legislation to us that they do some form of cost analysis benefit before they arbitrarily just pass the buck on to us. Happy to, happy to add a uh, paragraph to that. And then the only other one was, um, uh, and support the submission, but there were around 49 questions, specific questions. Are you confident that our submission has, have we sort of looked at all of those? Is there anything else that we're missing? Or you've, it, it feels to me the submission's primarily focused around our growth program and, and, and new ways to finance that. Yes, I think, um, great question. We, we acknowledge that LGNZ and Solgum and other parties have, have sort of tackled um, all 49, um, and they are lengthy and, and difficult to follow mm. submissions, so we felt that we'd probably focus on the matters okay. most relevant to us. But if you look at their submission, um, um, they do cover uh, some of those other points that you've touched on. Um, so yeah, we, we, we decided to do something that was a bit more focused and, and relevant to us. And I, I would also note, Councillor, that the, this inquiry is one of many vehicles that we're participating on in terms yeah. of funding and financing, and, and, and you'll note the, the corridor plan is mm -hmm. one, the funding and financing work streams we're we, we working with Treasury and other parties on, so, so mm -hmm. there are other things that we're doing as well. Okay, all right, thank you. Councillor Gary. Andrew, uh, <coughs> I was at the roadshow as well, and I brought up a couple of things there, um, the, and, our, and I've discussed it at our briefings as well, that the, um, the overall concept that property taxes is, an, is, a, is, a, is simply a mechanism that just does no longer work. I don't know if it's ever worked properly. Uh, it's not fit for the purpose. Um, and yet that is still, I don't know, uh, 70 to 80 per cent of local authority uh, funding is from property uh, taxes. So um, I raised that at the road show, went down like a lead balloon. Um, but it's, I mean, we can't... Avoid, it's silly to think that we can't uh, that we that we can continue on in that way. Um, the other thing I would like mentioned is um, 
So, so, so through the chair, sorry, Councillor Miller, are you asking for a change to the, the submission? Yeah, or? that our submission should raise the issue that um, that we, we, we well. I don't know who we is, but uh, that it is becoming more and more apparent that the ability of local authorities to fund themselves primarily through property taxes is defunct or is, is no longer correct. And I mean, it's we're kind of you know we're putting in petrol taxes, we're doing things like that, trying to trying to avoid the issue without, you know, going, skirting around the issue without taking a fundamental look at, is property uh, taxes a viable system of funding a local authority going forward? Okay. And, and I know that's probably, um, I, I might not be, there might not might, might be much support around this table, and if that's the case, it doesn't get in there, it might not be the, uh, the view of the staff either, but um, I think it's as clear as, Clear as anything that, 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 that that's one big issue, and the other one is. Um, so, Gary, I think that that's appropriate, and that's what this is. This roadshow was about to bring. Mm. Um, you're talking about more of a revolutionary look at the way it's done, um, and. Um, the, um, I don't think there's anything revolutionary about it. Well, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're talking but about it's a, a big, big picture, yeah. and um, so I do understand what you're. Where you're heading on that one? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the other one was, and I raised this at also at the roadshow, was the um, over capitalisation of in assets in terms of, and I've spoken around this hundreds of times around the table on this, that everyone's got to have a rugby stadium, everyone's got to have a cricket stadium, everyone's got to have a um, performing arts theatre, everyone's got to have an event centre, and we have just got too many of them um, in this. In the and I, and that's a tough one because that's um, if you want, you know. The local authority wants to have it, but no one's looking at it from New Zealand Incorporated point of view. So, Councillor Mallard, I, I believe we've touched on that with theme number five on page um, page 74, where we talk about um, duplicated, duplicated throughout the country. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. Yep. So we, we I would have just put things like massive catastrophic overcapitalisation rather than duplicated facilities. <laughs> All right, uh, Deputy Mayor Martin. Yes, uh, I, I think we should stress, uh, if we go back to Councillor Mallet, um, point and other points, is the, uh, the current massive reliance on a property tax system, and that system uh, cannot go on, you know, in, a, in, in, a, in other words, the, it cannot, the reliance cannot go on, and, and if, unless there are a range of other tools, within 10 years, I, I'm predicting, obviously, uh, funding of local infrastructure is essentially going to be broken. I think this is severe. I was personally disappointed with the road show. I was going along to hear sort of radical, innovative ideas, and I'm not sure if, in fact, that is the intent of a radical review. Um, so I, I actually find myself supporting um, Councillor Mallet in terms of I think we just have to pose that that question. Uh, for example, um, you can have a local authority for the next 10 or 15 years has an incremental rate increase, anything above CPI. There's eventually where the pipsqueak things don't uh, cannot carry on. Um, also, with regard to regional facilities, I think we obviously really need to, and I, I, it may be adequate, we need to emphasise that. We, we should explain, and I'm sorry I know I'm an organ grinder here, we should explain we're a unique city in that we are funding a whole lot of sub-regional facilities for which we get no um, funding from a lot of the users <coughs> of those sub-regional facilities, and so we really should be beefing up and saying how crucial it is that we do get some agreement on how we do some regional funding, you know, whether it's gardens, libraries, um, whatever. Strongly, strongly support um, the needing a radical overview with regard to the three waters, and that before any sort of assistance is given from any central government source, obviously it must be an efficient. I think I think you've probably covered that quite well, so that, that would be my take. I mean, I think we should be asking for a radical review, really, because to tinker within 10 years, I think we'll be back for another review within five or six years. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Dave. Mm, um, 
surprisingly, I also am moved by Councillor Mallett's arguments um, and uh, would agree with what uh, the Deputy Mayor's just said. Uh, it's clear, uh, perhaps the way it could be expressed rather than opposition to um, property tax, a strong suggestion that, that we are overly rely on it, that we're overly reliant on that, which causes all sorts of distortions. Um, we may not, I may not agree with Councillor Mallet on what the replacement should be. For instance, I would think that they should be looking at um, a version of income tax uh, to fund it, um, as opposed to perhaps user, user pays in the traditional sense. But either way, the system is broken and tinkering. I think the Deputy Mayor was wrong about one thing. He said it would be back within 10 years. It'll be back within five or six years if we don't actually have a radical look at it. I doubt that there's the um, mood to do that at go government level and certainly not um, at the level of officials um, who uh, have got no interest in doing anything but tinkering in this sort of area. They've shown that for 20 years, unfortunately, but nevertheless I think we still should make the point we do need a radical overhaul of the property tax reliance. Uh, Councillor Paula. A couple of sort of questions. Uh, first of all, just to start on theme area four around the open-mindedness on aggregation for the three waters. Um, and then they've got the bullet points uh, down there, which are largely I agree with. Um, I know from the conversations that the policy advisory group that I sit on in Wellington has had with the Productivity Commission, um, a lot of talk has been around how government plays a role in driving local government towards the most efficient um, model for, for water delivery, and that's not really mentioned here. We all know the history here with Waipa, Waikato and ourselves and our um, collective inability to land that. So um, local government New Zealand seem to have the view that government should be able to have some power to ensure that the most efficient scale it's got nothing to do with metres. It's got to do with the management of drinkable water, uh, wastewater and stormwater. Um, and it should be done at the most cost effective. But there's nothing here to suggest that there's any lever other than um, giving us a bit of funding and a few things. Or oh, I might have read that wrong, Blair. So. Yeah, and I think, uh, so what point, what, what um, I think Blair understands what I'm, oh, sorry, Three, theme, four, theme area four. Mayor Andrew, I um, think you understand where I'm yes, coming from. Yes, I do. And I guess, Councillor, we were, we, for this theme area four, we were an, informed by the recent submission this council put in on, um, on, the, on the waters reform program. So, so yeah. these um, themes reflect that. So, so uh, that was consistent with what the council signed off on last year. Um, I okay. guess the intention of what we, what we are saying is that um, this council is open to aggregation. Uh, recognises the challenges of aggregation in a voluntary context, recognises the government does have mm. levers it can bring to bear, uh, and, and we've intimated some of those levers which can help, help help that aggregation. Of course, the debate will be voluntary versus mandatory aggregation as That's well. That's right. That's right. I'll talk on that in my debate, maybe. But uh, another question, if I might, on theme area seven, uh, which talks about um, a number of things, regional fuel tax. This is consistent with where we went last time with the discussion of Regional fuel tax last Yes, year? and Council will, will note that the legislation um, that has passed does actually provide for um, regional but also sub-regional fuel tax. So, so the point that we submitted on has been recognised in the legislation. So, um, uh, of course, Prime Minister has come out and, and made a comment that there will be no um, regional fuel tax in, in their time frame in terms of the, this current term. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, what we sought, was, which was the provision of a sub-regional fuel tax, such as an area... Hamilton and one or two other councils is provided for legislation. Okay, so um, and C, the road border levy, can you talk me through that? So that was something raised at the council briefing, the notion that um, uh, this council funds considerable roading network and that there are a number of um, non-residents and non-ratepayers who, who come from outside and, and utilise our roading network and drive costs and so is there some mechanism to, to um, equitably um, share that share that burden, that, which is otherwise currently falling on our rate powers. And of course, that can flow both ways, mm -hmm. um, and so it's not an easy thing. But but this is where potentially the notion of 
uh, variable road price in electronic tolling, those sorts of things could come in. Excellent, thank you. Well, I might have a comment on that one too. Just um, in respect to, what, um, it's silent on a couple of things and there might be reason. Um, certainly it's silent on capital gains tax. I guess you're just waiting to see what the government does in that arena? Um, one, yes, that's absolutely correct. And secondly, um, whether that's a relevant tool for local mm. government, um, that's obviously a central government tool. Um, didn't see that really as part of our, our area of focus or mandate. Except that it might um, influence the amount of government money that, that can be diverted into the regions and I, I think it would be probably um, premature for us to take a view okay. on that. So that's just why you have... Yeah, no, that's fine. I thought that would be the case. The other aspect <clears throat> is in terms of um, road border levy, I thought, well, it's also quiet on what um, could be achieved through tourism levies, um, whether that be at the border... I mean, for as long as I've been in politics, the idea of either a bed tax or a border tax has been discussed and it just goes in a churn and nothing ever happens with that. Is that not, is that not irrelevant? Because we would be beneficiaries of any um, income derived? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, so tourism or, or bed tax wasn't, hasn't been raised by your colleagues to date. However, we're very conscious that... Um, sorry, Mayor Andrew has mentioned it to, to, to me prior to the meeting, um, and we're very happy to include a reference to a beer tax, and we, we're very conscious that that piece of work has been undertaken by uh, other, other councils more exposed to the impact of tourism than, say, particularly Hamilton, but it, it's certainly something that um, councils may wish to have in the toolbox of funding tools that is available to them. Yeah. So, I, I wouldn't like to, uh, me personally, I wouldn't like to um, uh, narrow it to bed tax, but a tourism tax of sorts and the, the way that's struck, whether it's in a border tax or however it gets done, is, is a separate part of the conversation. Yeah, there have been um, comments around potentially you know, a, a national um, amount, dollars per <laughs> night, uh, levied on both international and domestic tourism. And tourism. But, but I think the point being that we're happy if it's the move of the council to, to add a paragraph, um, a around, paragraph. around that, that a, a, some form of a tourism slash bed, bed tax is a revenue source that would be a a welcome addition to the toolbox of, of funding mechanisms for councils. So to you, Mayor Andrew, I would, I'd, I'd support a comment on tourism, um, capture some of the tourism tax, but I wouldn't want any reference made to bed or otherwise because, you know, we have never had a discussion about the um, bed tax versus a border tax when people arrive at our airports. Uh, things like that we haven't had a big enough discussion about. But in general, if we can do better out of the tourism revenue, I'm for that. Sure. Thank you. So can I just dive in here because I was going to request that a bed tax got included um, from we're talking with other mayors at the mayoral forums in Wellington and in Auckland. Um, the feedback is, is when you do a border tax, then the next fight becomes who gets the money, whereas a bed tax evenly distributes where the tourists stay. So if a lot more people stay in Queenstown long and they stay in Hamilton, it automatically divvies up. Um, where the tax goes, so um, I, I respect your request for a tourist tax or an airport tax to be included, but I certainly do want a bed tax included. I feel very sore to the fact that Auckland has got a bed tax, Auckland has got petrol tax, but we don't get it when we have the same growth of rate of growth per head of population and the same stresses as Auckland's gets, and if anything, we need it as much as Auckland to sort at our city before the problems come and we're in a position to do that. So um, if Auckland can have a bed tax, if Auckland can have petrol tax, um, I'm not for extra taxes, but it's got to be fair and even and other growth councils should be able to get those as well. And I see mm -hmm. Queenstown's right on the edge of getting their one approved as well, their bed tax approved. Thank you for that perspective. Well, because this is quite a broad submission, I just wanted to at least have some kind of place in yeah. there for a tourism discussion. I yeah. just, I so just if we can just ensure that. Paula's and my bed tax are included in the submission. We'll find a way to mould those two views, uh, Councillor. And then I think at the end of the day, Councillors, this is a submission to a process. They're going to report back, but yeah. I think the key point is that you'd so like... It can be an and or, tourism yep. and or. Yep. 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 You happy Thank with you. that? Yeah. I Thank think, you. Councillors, we, we acknowledge the work being done by other councils more exposed to this um, who will have more stronger views, and we can, we can acknowledge that in our submission. Councillor Rob. A point around, I'm surprised that we haven't got included in the submission a reference to the local government discussion paper of February 2015, 
which was in response to um, um, on local government on local government funding review. I know that we've picked up a number of the points that are in that report, but under 1.3, you've, you've made reference to other reports of the, or work undertaken by the commission. I wonder if somewhere in amongst there, if it's 1.3a, that you also make reference to that, and it was called the local government funding review discussion paper and it was released in February 2015. I think most councillors around this table are familiar with that report. But that's the one that picked up on, you know, a local take in the GST and a, and a whole host of others as an alternative yes. in support of Councillor Mallet um, of looking away from our reliance on, uh, our significant reliance on rating based on capital value of, of, of land. Thank you. We can add that reference. Thank you. Okay, so can I su just suggest going forward on these submissions that they are circulated ahead of time, and um, if you have thoughts and ideas, um, if you could email them in to whoever's writing the submission or distributing it, and if you could, s could you ensure that you CC in all elected members so that any pushback or any thoughts can be debated um, by email and included in the report pre-getting to the meeting. So I'm not, I'm not saying we still won't debate it like this, but um, when you do respond, CC in all members so we can all see what people are proposing. Okay, um, can we go straight to, um, to the vote on this? All those four? Any against? Carried unanimously, thank you. Okay, so we're now going to item T, sorry. Um, possibly uh, moved by myself, seconded by the Deputy Mayor on that one. Oh, sorry, Councillor James, thank you. It was you, sorry. I'm oh, just going back to the last paper. You seconded it. Okay, so we'll go to page 77. So, um, Thank you, Andy, for your work you've done on this um, paper. Uh, I have a, a motion to put on the board on this, which will get up um, while Andy starts his presentation. Kia ora, councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and answer any questions that you might have relating to this fund. Really want to acknowledge the the decisions that council has made to put aside the $2 million in the uh, ten-year plan to go towards the social housing fund, and want to just bring um, some quick acknowledgement to why I sit here today. The first part is that in the resolution for the ten-year plan, we were asked to come back prior to the 31st of March with criteria and guidelines that were formed in consultation with our community housing sector, and those conversations have been really live and fluid. And that has led us to this point where there is an opportunity to potentially explore a, a change from what was discussed in these chambers prior to the adoption of the 10-year plan. And so point 19 onwards talks around the land trust, which Mayor Andrew referenced in his chair's report. Uh, and there's the opportunity there, as Lindsay mentioned, a uh, coalition of the willing does exist within the city, particularly within the community funding partners that we have as a city council to explore what the social housing initiative of a lands trust could look like. Uh, we had some members uh, sit here and present, but we have others who have given apologies, including Momentum as a significant uh, supporter of wanting to uh, partner with council in ways that are possible in moving this forward. So really happy to answer any questions but do want to reiterate that we as a community have been talking about housing for a wee while, and that idea of a, using Lindsay's phrase again, the coalition of the willing, is, is an apt definition, particularly from a funder's point of view, of not just wanting to talk, but wanting to see action and tangible action that delivers housing outcomes for our community. So thank you, happy to answer. Uh, Councillor Gary. I think the saying co coalition of willing was from George W. Bush. Referencing Not today's debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, paragraph 15 on page 78. 
uh, about the fifth or sixth bullet points. There's two of them. Uh, it talks about density allowances within the district plan delivering affordable options and development contributions per bedroom charge affordable. Just expand on what you mean by that. Uh, so the, the first point there in terms of the density allowances, uh, oh, you'll be aware that parts of the city are zoned for high density Correct. housing, yes, which yes. creates a, a different product and generally a more affordable product than a, a okay. larger section. Uh, and then the development contribution, some of the changes through the policy recently has gone from a blanket, a div you know, a house is a house to if a house so is two bedroom or yeah. ten bedrooms, yeah. there's going to be a different <clears throat> development contribution. Okay, so what you're doing is saying, laying out things that council is already doing, is that right? That's to, correct. To uh, make housing more affordable. Yeah, so okay. we're, we're using a few different levers already as council, and this fund is another particular lever that we've um, got on the table. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dave. I'd just like to point out to Gary that uh, George Bush misused that Coalition of the Willing statement. It was properly used by Lindsay Cumberpatch earlier this meeting. <laughs> uh, but that aside, um, I really don't have an issue with anything in here except the timing, which is what I want to ask you about, and then perhaps even bigger problem with the Mayor's motion regarding the timing. I accept that can't, we can't decide it now, but putting it off to August or even September, as suggested, um, A, don't you think that that um, risks it becoming a highly political issue right in the middle of the election campaign, um, and perhaps more importantly risks decisions being made by this council not being implemented before the new council starts and being able to be... Um, changed and the whole thing having to be revisited, would it not be better to have the the next report back where we decide the direction of travel we're going to go? I mean, we're talking about it here, but when we actually make decisions, say, by the end of June, giving us time to start the, if it's a trust, we, lands trust we're going to set up, time to start that and lock in the contributions from the last LTP before the end of this triennium, in, which is in September. So my question, if you like, about timing implies that both what your suggestion is and the Mayor's. So the, my understanding, and our general managers uh, may want to elaborate, but my understanding is if we um, have the budget is, uh, is set, essentially, so if a decision was made to reallocate the $2 million in years two and three rather than years two to six, then that wouldn't be an election discussion because it would be in the budget as, as a whole rather than being a renegotiated point at the election. In terms of uh, us bringing back information, uh, we can work as hard as we can and probably can hopefully hit timelines a little bit quicker. Could Just you hit the end of June? Really, I, I guess is what I'm asking. Cause uh, I Sean and um, uh, acting CE, um can, can, is that realistic? Because, oh. uh, sorry, just kind of trying to grapple the whole. Uh, so, so we're on D. In terms of D, uh, so by the 30th of June, just in relation to D, and, uh, yeah. the, just uh, trying to understand members' requests there, if that's a uh, fully locked trust deed for a lands trust, or is that a... Because um, I guess no, one of the points. I'm, I'm following. It's your motion yeah. here, recommendation here, Andy, and, and yeah. it's very Sorry. similar to D up there, and both of them aren't the, the, the deed. Both yeah. of them just talk about the model and the criteria. Absolutely, then. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, and I'll move an amendment yeah. or what it asked the Mayor to amend it. Just, I don't want to get you to do work, it's impossible, yeah. but I think if we're going to then move to a deed, we need to yeah. start earlier, so that's yeah. what I'm asking. Uh, then, councillor, absolutely. So, um, June, uh, what's council meeting in June? Is, it's is it? 26th is the annual plan one. I don't know any other dates. 27th, is it? Sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep, that's fine with me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, councillor, councillor Angela. Andrew. Um, 
just so I can get this right in my head, the the six hundred thousand operating <coughs> budget from those two years. What are we not doing? Because that that's new money, isn't it? It's not that it's over and above the two million. It's no. not. No, it's it's, no, it's reallocating. It's part of the two million. It's two reallocating. Yeah. So rather than it's using a, a five-year allocation model, it's using a two-year okay. allocation model. Okay. Yeah, so if I can through through the chair, Councillor Eng. Hi. Um, so uh, currently in the ten-year plan, we have um, two million dollars um, debt-funded. Um, yeah monies towards social housing mm -hmm. and that is spread over year two to year six and the essence of this motion is saying let's bring it forward to spend a million dollars in year two and a million dollars in year three um, it would be helpful though if we could just for clarity the operating yeah. funding words if we could just call it debt funding actually what it is then yeah it would be um, more clear that, so, that was um, my next question general manager Dave could you come over sure. and work with them to get the wording so you're happy with it on that front um, thank you. Uh, next question. My reading of this is that it is a fairly significant shift from the resolution in the LTP, which was around a contestable fund for social housing. This is substantially different. So how are we planning to consult on this? Is that through the annual plan? Uh, my conversations that I've been part of with uh, some elected members and our funding partners and with our community uh, housing providers. They have talked very invariable uh, possibilities of how we could spend the $2 million allocated. The council talked around particularly those front end costs that were associated with providing more um, housing outcomes. Uh, this lands trust model, you are right, is, uh, is definitely a particular part of that. And the proposal here around buying land for the purposing of the social housing is very different from just funding the upfront costs. The conversations that I've been part of, there is support from that sector that this would be a really good outcome for us as a city and wider region. Uh, so, that I guess in terms of the public <coughs> consultation, I would, and I may be corrected, but I, I would say that that targeted consultation of those who play and live and breathe in the social housing environment is probably where we should take our lead rather than from a generic um, consultation. Thanks, Andy. So you just still you're still talking about social housing when we had the briefing. Uh, with the mayor when this idea was first raised, that was home ownership. So there's a vast difference between home, uh, home ownership and leasing land, and uh, which falls into affordable housing and social housing. Yes. So what's, uh, is this now shifted to the Community Land Trust for social housing? Uh, so I'll bring reference to attachment one, which talks around the the continuum. And you are right; the there are particular uh, definitions that are understood and loaded. Uh, and when we use some words, and social housing is often referenced to really the emergency and the state housing provision. This particular lands trust conversation has stepped more into the affordable, but recognising that that's still a really broad continuum when we talk about uh, some of the wraparound services that are needed. So our partners of Habitat for Humanity, they, they work in a really um, social equity kind of space, which is in the blue columns, but it's still with social outcomes. And so, sorry, that's the, the use of the social housing is really around that support that is needed to assist. When we talk generally a lands trust, uh, if, if anyone's been able to read Sam's report, there's often reference to the, the collective use of land that goes beyond just the, the dwelling. Uh, that isn't necessarily set, and some of the detail in the forming of a trust would look at if we're talking about uh, individual parcels of land or a large block of land that could uh, flex a little bit around some of those social outcomes. But I guess when we talk about the uh, a term that's been used a little bit is the missing middle of 
Yeah, so I don't yeah, so like it is that movie. term, it is so movie. I think so, it's yeah. awful. Can, can I just interrupt? Yeah. Um, well, Angela's asking, yeah. does this require consultation? Um, from me reading Sam's report, um, the missing middle is still part of social housing, Christ. but that doesn't mean that that's technically and legally correct. Um, Angela's, my understanding of what Angela's asking is, um, do we have to consult because there's a change from social housing to the middle, mis middle, middle missing middle, or is the missing middle qualified in the in the social housing? So we probably need some feedback on that. Um, yes, if, if, through you, Chair. If Please I can... don't use the missing middle. It's awful. A missing middle is all through this report. I don't. I, and... Yeah, but I think it's horrible to label so people a group of people who don't own homes the missing middle. <laughs> but this is specifically aimed at those who earn fifty to ninety thousand dollars. And, okay, and so say that. Sorry, sure. not. Uh, yeah, so just in respect of the consultation right. piece, so the the uh, this doesn't it's not an annual plan matter. Um, so the the funding allocation is um, will be accounted for in the annual plan. So when the annual plan um, budget comes back for council approval, um, that will be the the moving of that sort of the um, one point uh, the the funding from future years into um, to the annual plan year. Um, so that doesn't itself require, require a consultation. consultation. Um, so the, it's not an annual plan consultation matter, okay. I think, would be okay. the answer to that question. So, and, and so are we confident then that the change from what we consulted on in the annual plan, uh, sorry, in the LTP, which was a, a seed fund for upfront costs, to this, which is significantly different, that just doing what you said, Andy, which is targeted consultation this uh, is enough and who would you target I'm assuming it would be social housing providers and agencies wouldn't it uh, you're correct yeah even so, even though this is ratepayer money and we a uh, general residential ratepayer money and we consulted through the LTP the general public you don't think it's significant enough that we consult again my my understanding is there is a commitment from council to affect the the housing provision and create housing outcomes for our community, and so that two million. My my personal uh, my my professional understanding is that the targeted consultation is is a way to ensure that we as council don't inadvertently waste the money that is the ratepayers' money, but that we get the best bang for buck. And that conversation with the sector around how would we best use the details of that $2 million, this has come up as a, a, a an opportunity that is supported, both from a others potentially giving money and land to the task, but also supporting the idea that the the offering is not something that is currently in the market of Hamilton and therefore there is value to all ratepayers from the, the possibilities that, that exist here. So I think the targeted consultation, we've got to this position because of those those ongoing negotiations around how do we best use that money. And so I don't think the ratepayers would feel aggrieved by the change. Okay. And just, um, so D, just so I understand the resolu resolution fully, um, can we just move D? Yep, thank you. Uh, a Chief Executive will report back to Council in June on the proposed land trust model. So that would include how it works, all the financials around your leasing in a, the original thing the Mayor talked about was home ownership, leasing the land, where those, where that revenue goes, does it go back to the ratepayer, does it go into the trust, all of those, that conversation will be Yep, correct, it's bas basically the, the, frame, the whole framework, how it works. Yep, as well as any partners who would be on that trust, what that trust constitution or agreement would look like, yeah. Correct, it may not be, as Andy said before, it may not be the, you know, the agreement itself, but it okay. might have the key principles and key yep. clauses you'd have in there. Yeah, yep. okay. Thank you. Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I see what's in the motion, but <clears throat> is there evidence to suggest in the New Zealand environment that a community land trust would work in terms of practically, in a, in a practical sense, in being able to get 
those people who are in that targeted area, and I'm not going to use the word, but uh, the words, but in that targeted area would actually achieve the outcomes that we're setting out to achieve. And I've got a list of examples down here, but the one that sticks in my mind is that first tier lenders in New Zealand seem to seem to um, um, run a mile when leasehold land is being spoken about and, and the interest rates that they will potentially lend to on a on a leasehold land arrangement tends to be much higher than than um, a mum and dad might get on a on a on a property where they own both the land and the building. My understanding of the situation with a lot of lenders is there is nerve still in this space, but there's been some really good relationships brokered through uh, examples of New Zealand Housing Foundation, uh, where they are in regular conversation with particular lenders who back the support of that organisation to then leverage out to families. And so the model that would be proposed here, uh, there would be that part of the element would be the forming of those good relationships. The New Zealand Housing Foundation, Habitat for Humanity, Community Housing Aotearoa have some really solid relationships through the work that they've done in Queenstown Lakes, but also some of the work that's occurring in other territorial authorities like Dunedin currently, where I think the, the lenders will uh, are willing to engage in that conversation. Potentially not all the lenders at this point, but it is a growing portfolio of partners from a banking perspective who would be interested. One of our community funding partners um, is a local um, or a, a bank. Uh, and so in the discussion that the funding forum has recently had, some of that was, was you know, upfront and talked about. And so that will be part of the work that we will bring back to ensure that we don't just theoretically have a national a opportunity, but we do have local providers who yep. are willing to support and partner. And so you're quite confident that those lenders who you refer to uh, will lend at rates w which will be affordable um, in the context of yep. there being this... Um, this um, preconceived view about leasehold land not giving as good a security as freehold land might. The can, I, can I just jump in there? Um, we know that the New Zealand, founding, New Zealand Housing Foundation and the Queenstown model allow the land to be used as equity. So the leasehold land itself becomes the equity to do the build on the, on the property. But the person, the mortgage... The mortgage... Is to the person who's doing the mortgage The mortgage or... Mortgage or doesn't have any ownership in that land. How no. could that? Oh, that they're, they're signing the mortgage documents with the resident, with the person purchasing the house. So the trust allows the land to be used as equity for improvements. Okay, I'd like I'd like to see that in a that, bit that more back, yeah, in a bit more detail than yeah. perhaps that explanation. Um, yeah. I just wonder, with your indulgence, uh, Mayor Andrew, whether you would consider slightly modifying that motion and under B where you've got uh, is directed towards a community land trust um, we change the word directed to bit to uh, is a or no take the word is directed away and be available towards a community land trust to be available what yeah Becca there's two B's there it should there should be five, so it should end in E. And I wonder whether that may C. that may <laughs> help answer um, Councillor O'Leary's concerns, and also not necessarily restrict how we spend that money, because I've been involved in discussions, uh, as have um, Deputy Mayor and Councillor McPherson, towards um, prior to this land trust idea coming through. Um, been involved in discussions with some of the social housing providers for other uses, and if this land trust doesn't have the legs to to go any further, I wouldn't like to think that we've restricted the two million dollars solely to that to that um, that 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 particular idea or venture. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Jeff. 
you, uh, Mayor Andrew. Can I just very quickly just test my understanding of it um, on a couple of things? One is, uh, is, is it is it correct that like once this thing is up and running and reaches sufficient scale? Um, that it, it will it will cater for a slightly wider sector of the population than the as a, the, the the status quo with the seed funding for the for the social housing. I mean, is it a slightly wider group? You talk about the missing middle. So, so the the model is um, there's Housing New Zealand and other providers who provide for the elderly and provide for um, those who aren't working and those who are really. Um, yep struggling to get going and then once they get going stay with them through their jobs as their income builds up and they increase the rent to market rent as their incomes build up but those um, people never get into owning their own home and so they pay rent between in Hamilton between three and five hundred dollars a week rent for the rest of their lives because they can never actually get into anything they own so this is about helping that group of renters to get into a um, to get into home ownership and um, by doing it by not owning the land but owning the improvements on the land. So it would be their home as long as they stayed in it and as long as um, for the rest of their life. Mm, mm. Um, so we did have a briefing on this, but you yeah. weren't here. You were, oh, I no, you were I stuck no, I was, on a ship. No, I, was, I, I, oh, you um, I sat in on, oh, on, a, on yeah. your mayor's thing on it. Yeah. Um, and I'm just trying to get my head around because there's a big group in the middle you know, pro, you know, of people earning uh, not high-income earners who you know struggle with home ownership? I guess I'm just trying to get a feel for for if it's if it's targeting a slightly wider t sector of population than the social housing, or if it's the same territory. No, I, I would say it's the upper end of the social housing of 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 getting people actually through to home ownership, and um, there are cities in the states that have up to 8% of the land of the city now because this is an enduring and a growing trust. It's something that feeds on itself and grows with time. Yep. Yep. And, and there are cities in the states that have um, up to 8% of the land area are owned by these trusts. Okay. Second, the second part of it was just the financial side. I was just trying to get my head around, is that different than your um, proposal in terms of the impact on the council's debt capacity? Because uh, in, in your one, it talks about the fact that it will reduce the council's debt capacity. Um, there'll be an impact in year three. Is that is this the same as that or not? Yep, yes, it's the same. same. Uh, oh, sorry, David. Oh, to the chair, oh, um, absolutely the same. Just worded differently. So um, just just for memory for councillors, we have um, from a debt to revenue perspective in the finance committee on the 21st, we we said that year three was always our toughest year in terms of. Um, coming up against that that uh, two thirty percent limit uh, in that finance committee, we talked about uh, twenty million dollars headroom, but we also talked about emerging issues associated with uh, a number of topics that councillors are aware of. Um, so, um, in terms of the move, th this this yep. this won't make a significant impact on on um, that twenty million dollar debt headroom. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. This needs to be discussed in context with the emerging issues. Yep. I suppose. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ryan. Thanks, Chair. Um, just two questions, maybe three. Um, Andy, earlier we heard that there's been some land potentially earmarked. Forgive me if I've missed that, but where is that? Uh, there's definitely conversations that I'm aware of that I'm not too sure how public are, uh, but there is land between current landowners who are talking to some of our philanthropic trusts around within weather, the boundaries uh, w within the uh, the wider borders of not within the city boundaries but close to the, the city population okay sorry I'm not too sure how public that yep, is sure. so, yeah. um, how many partners obviously we're having conversations with um, uh, habitats and 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 Mr. Cumberpatch and, and others but how many partners do you think we will have or need to have um, in this Ultimately, if council committed two million dollars towards a lands trust, uh, then that has a scale that would affect the outcomes of housing uh, for the city at a level. Uh, if we were to get five other partners who were able to commit something of a similar level of investment, you know that kind of just gets bigger and bigger. So, uh, from a what do we need? 
uh, potentially council could be courageous and just spend $2 million and we would get housing outcomes. But the more partners we have, then the greater those outcomes could be. From conversations with our uh, Well Energy Trust, uh, they were always very interested in using the, one of their grants schemes to look at housing, uh, and that's currently in the upcoming annual plan is $500,000, so they've talked to partnership with us in that regard. That we'd need to again test and confirm if council decided to change you know, from a, a broad social housing fund to a lands trust, whether that still holds. Uh, from conversations that we've had around the table as community funding providers in the city, there is support for that. Uh, there is, as Lindsay mentioned, the potential that they might have some land so that they could support the initiative with. Uh, I know Gallagher's are exploring options, you know, since they started with Habitat and, and the SHA environment. So they're very keen to continue to explore that and partner with us at, rather than duplicating. One of my points in the item is that we may not be best served to create a new entity. We may be better to partner with an existing entity. And part of the work between now and the 27th of June will be to ensure that we are clear for us as a city whether we're better placed to create a new or to alter an existing or to write encumbrances into an agreement with something else. So that'll be part of the work that we as staff undertake. Cool, thank you. Councillor Mark. Um, interested in the other entities that we're discussing with, like obviously Well Trust, Trust Waikato, um, uh, who else? Mo momentum. Oh, momentum uh, is in the, in the mix. We've so. got some family trusts that are a part of the community funding network. Uh, we've got some yeah. some private uh, trusts as well, um, you know, from the, you know, the Brimer Trust to ANZ Foundation. So there's a raft of people who sit regularly in the room and discuss what's important for right. the philanthropic sector to be funding within the city. Because this kind of strikes me something that momentum would probably take the lead on and then we would tap into it. That is a, a potential option, and it, but may not be the best option. Right. Uh, you know, I'm aware of, you know, Habitat for Humanity uh, are our local provider who play particularly in this uh, space, uh, not to the scale that we're potentially mm. talking about. So, would I guess part of the work between now and the 27th will be to to really drill down into those particular options mm. of. A momentum or a habitat or a something else mm. or a, another party that mm. um, you know sitting around the table with the energy to to resource this yeah. as well okay thank you okay can we go straight to the vote on this one um, so um councillor Dave are you happy to second that I just feel with your putting the two million dollars up in the first place you drove that and I think it's appropriate that you yeah okay uh, councillor Paula um, my view on this, uh, I was a bit confused about how the number was, uh, the money was moving around to begin with. Um, the sooner we start to tackle uh, the needs of the social housing um, community, the better. Uh, we, I think we, do, we must have some skin in the game. If we don't, we risk not actually delivering on our promise of affordability uh, that meets the needs of all our people. Uh, so we can't leave some behind while we um, continue to supply. We can't leave people behind. We must supply houses that are fit for purpose, and that means looking at the social housing arena and seeing how we can best be helpful. Um, and we heard a number of uh, people in the public forum today talking in praise and strongly about uh, community land trusts, and it sounds like there is a lot of momentum. Oh, no pun intended, because momentum are also involved. There's a lot of momentum behind that, a lot of discussion going on. I've attended some of the funders' meetings in the past, and I know there's a lot of good energy and will to tackle this. This is a, this is a severe problem in Hamilton, the ability for people to get housing at an afford fit for purpose housing at an affordable price is a big issue. We cannot walk away from it. I'm no expert in this, but I do think we've got to have some skin in the game, and that's why I support this as a start to go forward from. Councillor Jeff. 
Thank you, uh, Mayor Andrew. I, uh, I'm supportive of this. I think it's uh, innovative. I think it's progressive. And, uh, and I, I think um, we all know that the, the housing crisis has been something that successive governments have grappled with. Um, they've tried you know, traditional means, but just building more houses, which we're trying to do, um, cheaper houses, smaller houses, uh, SHAs, which now apparently are no longer the flavour of the month. They're about to be uh, um, ditched. So uh, I, I think um, there's a lot going um, for this uh, idea. Um, we need something innovative, something different. We know that the price of land is actually the big problem often, and this confronts that problem, or tries to. And we've heard today that there's plenty of support within the city for this. Uh, I'm just hoping that we can get the government involved um, significantly as well. Um, and uh, so, yep, I, I'm absolutely keen to see this proceed. Thank you. Councillor Dave. Thanks. Uh, look, I agree with um, Paula and Jeff in their speeches. Uh, I think um, if we go along with this, basically says that uh, we want to be part of the coalition of the willing as well, since that's a much misused phrase today. <laughs> um, we abrogated our responsibility in the social community housing area about three years ago. This gets us back in that game, gets us some influence, um, and it, I believe uh, being involved in this, not taking complete charge of it or anything like that, but being involved is a core part of council's business, any council in New Zealand actually, given the current situation. We heard from Lindsay Cumberpatch this morning that we're about 3,000 housing units short at the moment in Hamilton. Um, this is not going to solve that problem overnight, but it starts to address um, a gap in the area. Uh, Habitat, as I think Andy just said, is a relatively small player in terms of the size of the gap. There are some players at the rental end of the market. Um, the rentals and state housing things and even council-owned uh, rental properties uh, put you at the mercy of policy makers, which change from time to time. This gets people uh, potentially into the ownership game. Uh, it uh, gives them independence and ownership and uh, creates... Uh, probably like um, creates, creates the ability for people to move up with the mayor. It's probably like uh, Councillor O'Leary. I'm not that keen on the term missing middle because I think it can be a bit pejorative. I'd rather uh, I'd only rather describe the actual issue. I'm, I'm not even thinking it's necessarily a dollar amount. We're just helping more people get into the housing game by removing the cost of the land associated with their housing ownership situation. That's what we're doing and that's what this is about. Um, the history in parts of the United States, we're surprised they are quite a leader in this area, has been very good uh, and um, some of the older and larger um, housing trusts, which are not in the big cities necessarily, and quite a town smaller than Hamilton, have shown that they are major influencers of the housing situation in those areas and there's quite different outcomes for those communities as opposed to places where they don't have a player like that. Um, Burlington, Vermont is one of them, a town of about uh, probably not much more than 100,000 um, where a certain mayor in the late 1980s for Bernie Sanders started it and it's um, still going strong as the longest and oldest and strongest in the states now. Um, so. Uh, I think um, I'd like to come back in 30 years and see how this has developed. Uh, thank you, Mayor Andrew. Look, I think the Land Trust offers um, some clear options, um, and I hope that the sector picks up on it. When uh, I supported uh, Councillor, Councillor Dave during the long-term plan on this $2 million fund, I was hopeful that um, Council would take... Uh, to some extent, a backroom uh, involvement that we would let the sector drive and tell us where they could best use uh, what is a relatively small amount to deal with a fairly, fairly major problem that we and the rest of the country have around uh, housing and affordable housing. So I'm still of a mind that I would like to see the council take 
very much um, a secondary role going forward and that the sector drives this. And the more of these uh, community trusts and those uh, specialists within the sector involved, I think the better um, value the city will get back uh, rather than having council too heavily involved. Um, Councillor Ziggy, Leo, Gary and I attended a drop-in session this morning on, uh, with some of our council statisticians and one of the outcomes of uh, the discussion that we had this morning, interestingly enough, is that the median value of uh, a residential property in Hamilton is currently about 545,000 uh, and the median value of a section or land is 450,000. So that gives you a bit of an indication as to how expensive land is and what a very high component it, it makes in terms of a, residential, uh, of a residential dwelling. So look, I'm supporting this at least in the start-up phase, um, but I am supporting it on the basis that I anticipate that the community uh, that that sector of the community will come to the table and work with council and will ultimately take the dominant role around running this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Andrew. Um, I supported this proposal through the LTP because I, I believed it was going to be delivering social housing to the city. I'm not I'm not sure that this is. When I think about what the mayor, the mayor's verbal update to us was quite, I think, quite significantly different to what we have now. I think what I'm hearing now is a bit of a mixed model. Um, that there will, this proposal will deliver some social housing, but also could deliver some affordable housing. But I'm a little uncomfortable that I'm not really, I don't really have a really clear understanding about that. Um, social housing is the thing that I think we need. And I, uh, I have to say, I supported the selling of the pensioner housing because it moved it from uh, just being for older people to being for all people that needed social housing. It also took new tenants down from $117 a week to $57 a week, and more importantly, still delivers social housing for the city. So that's why I supported it in the LTP for those reasons. There's also 10,000 households on the housing register for our region waiting for social housing at the moment. The number one need on that register is inadequate is because of inadequate housing. Now I don't have the answers to that, and I'd like to, the answers to that question. I don't know what inadequate housing means. Um, the second reason those ten thousand people are on that register in the region is because of homelessness. Now you can't transition a person who's living without a permanent home into a home of their own. Um, and the, high, the other thing that was interesting on that government report was that the highest need on the social housing register for our region is Māori men aged between 24 and 39 wanting a one-bedroom apartment so, or a one-bedroom unit. Um, th that was the highest need, so I don't... I, I still, I'm going to support this at this stage, but I have some fairly serious concerns that we're not addressing the need, the considerable need for social housing. When I look at that report and when I look at those statistics, that seem to be getting worse over time. So um, I'll support this to the next step, but unless I get some very clear information on exactly what the proposal was trying to seek and whether it's actually addressing some of those issues that our, our region and our city is facing, I wouldn't be able to support it further. Councillor Sigi. Thank you so much. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, look, to, I am supportive of this um, motion at the moment as well, just like Councillor O'Leary. 
Um, but what I'm really looking forward to is um, out of this, hopefully with, with all the other funders, that there will be um, some, um, Councillor Taylor already talked about innovative ideas, but I'm not sure where he went with that. But for me, it's <laughs> about co-housing, tiny housing projects, container housing, maybe even going as, well, ideas from Habitat going into owner builder, which might help some of these people to get into their housing. So we need to not just look at housing again, another three bedroom or two bedroom um, house to stand alone in its own by, you know, not very community minded. I believe we need to be more community minded community-minded when we look at housing that way. So I'm looking forward to some really, really innovative ideas. And that hopefully will, bringing that in, and just what Councillor Leary talked about was if that's, um, w whether we're looking for one room or one bedroom apartments, <laughs> we've got containers stacked up to the gazoodos in Hamilton, um, w whether we can use some, some of these ideas or some of these resources that we've already got and use them in in some of these housing projects that we could um, could do in, in that arena. So I, I'm looking at for a really, really broad look at, um, at social housing, um, missing middle housing, whatever it's going to be called. And um, I, I'm and I'm sure we can do this. Other cities have done it, and I'm sure we can do that too. I'm a little bit sad after selling the um, pensioner housing for 23.5 million that we're only putting 2 million in. It would have been great to put a bit more in, but that's all we've uh, agreed to at the, uh, at the time, and that's fine. But maybe at, at the future we can look at um, putting more in, or maybe there's more funders coming on board to to uh, grow this. But yeah, so looking forward to some amazing ideas and and uh, uh, helping both sectors, not not just a what do we call that missing middle? I don't like that word either. Uh, and the social housing as well, so we can combine both of them. Thank you, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Um, look, there are tons of things we can do to address the housing uh, crisis, housing issues, the um, expensive pricing of housing, but th this is not one of them. Um, we can deal with our zoning system, our rating system, our balmy ideas about urban design, and probably most importantly, we could address our massive, massive overspending on facilities and services which are not our core services. Um, so all I can see is this is us trying to be heroes with other people's money again. So I didn't support this in the 10-year plan. I will not support it now because this is not the way you address a housing system. This is not the way we should be addressing it. We have way bigger, more important levers we can pull, which we just simply will not address. Um, and it's very sad that we've come to this because this is another $2 million of um, ratepayers' money. Um, which I don't think ratepayers are going to get $2 million worth of value out of. Point of order, <clears throat> we are not debating the issue of $2 million being provided. We may be debating the timing of it. Uh, that's the furthest in the financial area. That's an LTP decision that can't be debated anymore. Yeah, so um, that was a little misleading, Gary, but you can carry on if you haven't finished. No, I'm not interested now. Good that. Councillor Ryan. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree again with a lot of what's been said. And, and uh, Councillor Rob, I just note you had two minutes 46 left of your five minutes there, so you, you still had some more time. I was speaking faster. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> this is collaboration. This is, this is smart. Um, I think this is better than pensioner housing in that it's, it's, it's a hybrid format. It's part of the solution. We're not a landlord, but a partner. And I'd like to see more of this sort of um, stuff go before council where we're partners and not trying to do it all on our own strength. I like the quotes that were mentioned today. Uh, Lindsay Cumberpatch mentioned per per perpetual affordability. I'll try that again. Perpetual affordability. And uh, Samantha Rose mentioned housing subsidies which can be recycled for generations. And I think those are powerful things. So I'm a big supporter of today's motion. Deputy Mayor Marson. Thank you very briefly. I just want to um, voice my thanks to the 
uh, ind key individuals and the philanthropic uh, groups that were represented in the public session and those in the audience and those who were due to make a submission but in the end didn't and for their incredible energy and hard work uh, and, and the work they have done which of course um, will hopefully leave a legacy of um, for many, many people in this city in terms of the people who come to, to live in decent housing in terms of the young lives and opportunities and families that affects. Uh, I respect totally democratic votes around this table. Uh, I am still on record of saying that the pensioner housing, sale of the pensioner housing stock by a majority vote of the previous council and the land it stood on uh, was in my view a very terrible tragedy. It demonstrated short-term thinking, and I also want to acknowledge your worship, uh, your uh, courage, very rare in politics, to acknowledge that in your own case you had made an error of judgment in your view. I don't mean disrespect to people who hold a different view. And being positive, I do want to absolutely acknowledge the work of, of Rob and Dave in giving us a way forward, and the work both of my colleague councillors have done to bring us into this particular position. I think that's excellent because I do acknowledge that now uh, we, we do work with an incredible amount of energy in terms of the social housing and philanthropic sector. I do think, uh, and perhaps I might slightly disagree with Councillor Pascoe, I think we need to be a proactive partner but um, you know, and provide all, every assistance we can, but I will certainly be um, supporting um, this uh, motion going forward and uh, cross fingers, hopefully it may lead to some very, very positive social outcomes. Councillor Mark. Thank you. I, look, I wasn't going to speak, I was just going to quietly hit support, but uh, I, I need to take issue with something that Councillor Mellon has said. For many arguments, I've heard him going on about how our number one priority is housing. Our number one priority is housing. You know, you can't have cycleways, we need housing. Can't have this, we need housing. Now something's coming up proactive about housing. We don't want that. No, they're spending money. We can't do that. It just doesn't make sense to me, Gary. But, you know, I say that with respect. It just doesn't make sense. I'd be keen to find out the logic of your thinking there. It is collaborative, and I think it, it's doing something much more within our control, and I've, I, I'm suggesting it will be a lot more successful than the SHAs. So let's get into it. Um, so... This is, the land trust is an enduring model, and it's a model that will grow on itself decade after decade. And nearly everybody who's in this room are in the financial and privileged position of being able to have, to choose to have home ownership should they wish to. But this will, this will make it um, open the door to let other people who normally would never be able to own their own land, or their own housing, own a house that they can live in for the rest of their lives and be proud of it through the Land Trust. And the other point I want to make is, is that when we put people into home ownership account, uh, home, home ownership owners, ownership through the Land Trust model, that frees up the rentals and frees up social housing for the next lot of people to be able to move into those social housing and into those rentals. So it, it, it actually has uh, the bonus effect of freeing up housing at the bottom end for social housing as people flow up through the system. So we'll vote on the hands on this. Um, all those for? Any against? Councillors Mallet dissenting. The motion is carried. Okay, we're moving now. Uh, no, I need to get this one through because it lines up exactly with the one that we've just had. So um, it's item 11, page 82, and then we'll go on to your one. This shouldn't be a long item. Understood. Flexible. What? This, so just we're, so we're on page 82. So this, hang on, there is a, there is a, a motion already here. There is a change to make, um, which I'll get Becca to get on the board. 
and it's a change. Um, and I'll, I'll talk that through while we're waiting. So basically, um, and because of time, um, basically us as the capital beneficiaries of the Well Energy Trust, and with submissions going out on the Well Energy Trust, um, what this motion is proposing is to add to the submission is that the Well Energy Trust matches Hamilton City's $1 million a year for the Social Housing Land Trust, and uh, or more should we choose to put more in. So that's the essence of what the change in the submission, um, uh, the adding to the submission is. That our submission requests that they match what we are doing in the social in the in the land trust um, area. So um, that should be on the board. It's coming, and um, once it's up, um, that, that's just a quick explanation of of where I'm heading. Chair, what, what's so different about changing the submission here to the various minor changes that we made to the last submission on the productivity, on the uh, income, uh, the funding for the Productivity Commission, the, the, where no. we just agreed, where, where I think we just agreed we didn't subsequently put those changes via a motion? Is, isn't this a lot more direct? Yeah, it's very direct. It's about um, requesting that the fund that we're capital beneficiaries of um, um, direct a um, million dollars or more if we put it up directly into the same fund, in the same land trust that we are, which will bring $2 million a year into the land trust instead of one, or, or more should we choose to put more in. But aren't we asking them to change their plan then, the plan that they've submitted to no, us? No, we're putting a submission in on their plan. On their plan. Yeah. So this is Hamilton City Council putting a submission in. Yeah, so it's a draft plan that they are at prepared this, to at change. At this stage, yeah. No, okay. well, we're, we're putting a submission and it'll be up okay. to them okay. to choose Look, what I, Yeah, thank you, I understand now. Okay. Yeah. So um, if everyone's happy with that, should we go to the board to vote? Or sh um, so um, seconded by Councillor Dave. Yep. Through, through you, Chair, can I just make one small sure. comment? Uh, just in the staff recommendation, there's also a um, note that um, in D approves an elected member to present the submission. So you can, if you want to nominate someone to present that submission as part of the part of the motion. Um, so I'd quite do. like to make that submission if, if um, yeah. Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay. With your leave, Mary Andrew will adapt the staff recommendation as it's written there, replacing B with your motion, so that it picks up noting the final submission will be sent and noting that you'll be representing the, yeah? Lovely, thank you. All right, so um, uh, to Councillor Gary. Um, I would like to move another uh, amendment that they reinstitute the, dis the power discount scheme, if I can get a seconder. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you. That's what I expected. Okay, Councillor Angela. No. Are you? Uh, have we got a seconder? Yep. Thank you. Okay, so that becomes an amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Angela. Just some clarity on um, this, if I can. So we are. The, you, you're wanting uh, to re the trust to request a match dollar for dollar if our proposal goes to head, and for them to consult in their annual plan. No, sorry, that, if that's what it says, it's not right there. No, it probably doesn't, it's just it. Oh. it it's for me, it's the Mayor, yeah. when we go to put the submission in, actually give a verbal submission to back up the written submission. So do you need all of that then? I mean, you're going to present, you're going to present. Well, we need to get it in writing in the written submission before the written submissions close. Oh, no. So this is adding to the written submission that staff have put up. Mm. It is incredibly yeah. resolution. You could just say um, that we move uh, that the the mayor's submission support, inclu supports yeah. the uh, proposers. Uh, yes. They match dollar for dollar in support of our previous resolution. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Rather than spelling it all out again, yeah. yeah. Would just make it. 
But yeah, I'm fine with that. It's yeah, yes, yeah. because we've made the motion. You just want it to be consistent with the with the last and, thing we passed. Yeah, and that when you yeah. go and present our submission, you can talk in more detail if they require it on that. I think a lawyer wrote it and got paid, paid <laughs> by the word. Have you got some words, Dave? He, like this, she said. Uh, Councillor, <laughs> Councillor Dave. <laughs> Councillor Dave, that's fine if you want to go that way, but this here just lays it out so that it goes straight through into the submission. But you have delegated authority from Council now from our previous item in the discussion. Yeah. We, we can simply say that we received the report in a... We don't even have to say that. You're going to speak there. You're going to anyway. You now have a decision on the box. The this decision on the too box of the previous item yeah. is, gives you authority, authority to speak to that anywhere, actually. Yes, it does. I think this is overly complicated and I couldn't support it. Oh, that's a, I don't know what it's asking. <laughs> right. Sorry, we're just stopping for democracy for a few minutes. Councillor Mallet is. Uh, the motion is currently framed with the addition of reintroduce the electricity rebate scheme. Uh, but now that the uh, motion on the board, there is some doubt about how that's going to be framed. I'm seeking guidance from you all about what should be on the put we should be putting up on the screen, please. At this because it's going to take a lot longer through this item than you maybe anticipated. Can we lay this one on the table so staff and, and elected members can deal with it in your lunch break? And could we please do the eyesight item so that I can get away? Yeah, I think that's fine. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Pardon? No, well, let's see what at least I can have um, um, a voice on it. So, okay. I, I, So we're now on item 13, page 120. Um, recommendation um, B. I think it's B. Isn't it? Yeah. B, C and D. B, C and D. Thank you. And seconded by Councillor Taylor. Oh, well, they'll chuck in A, because A has just received the report. That's all cool. OK, thank you. I'd have an amendment, um, Mayor Andrew, and my amendment is A, which has received the report. And make no decision on the rest, Angela? No, I stand as quite as I start the names. Oh, OK. So is there a second for Paula's motion? Seconded by Councillor Jeff. So a uh, second for Angela's motion? Okay. Uh, so uh, for the uh, amendment, it's seconded by Councillor Rob. That's for A and D. Yep.
Uh, Councillor Jones. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to know if it was uh, if the ISO was moved to the art post. Is there is there room in that building to operate the ISO? Yes. So um, the work that Sean's team's done with Shri down there and the team, um, yes, it would be reconfigured somewhat. Um, and the, oh, I think the sum of money is actually in the report um, what that'll cost to do that. Um, so that can be reconfigured so that there's a eyesight section to it which integrates with the rest of Arts Post. So we think it'll work quite well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. On page 123, paragraph 36, there's an appalling revelation um, that the council overheads are between 294,000 and 304,000 per annum. What on earth makes that up? Get David to talk about. So that's our. Um, we have direct costs, obviously. The direct you understand what overheads costs. are. Yeah, I understand yep. that. And then the there's the what we call indirects, which are the overheads, yep. which is um, a whole range of things from governance costs yep. uh, that are allocated right across the council. So, so it's that. So this is for it. a pretty little operation like Eyesight. We've got three hundred thousand dollars a year overheads. That's, that's that's astonishing. So I don't have the detail on me now, but I can I can separate that and send it out to you. But um, overheads are prorated for the the costs that we can't directly apply to a specific activity, as you know. And so um, the eyesight um, would would attract a fair amount in proportion to every other activity council has. So over half it's lost because it loses about between five hundred and six hundred thousand dollars a year. So, um, and that's all cost directly out of the ratepayers' pocket. Of uh, almost half of its loss, more than half of its loss, is actually overheads. That's correct. Correct. Uh, those, the, those overheads, um, should I site be um, closed down, we would obviously try and uh, reduce those They'd overheads as much as possible. Somewhere else. But they would. Um, there will be some stranded Sneer overheads over that take two or three years to to reduce. Right. Mm. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Martin. Um, two, two things. Can we just be reminded what is the total uh, quantum we spend on tourism as, from, a, from a city budget? Uh, <laughs> off the top of my head, that's probably a bit hard to calculate. Um, so obviously we have a number of facilities. Yeah. Um, obviously we fund Hamilton Waikato Tourism. and. Yeah, could we just grant, be reminded of that figure? If we, six hundred thousand, if I recall correctly. So if we added that. And I then, mean, I think with respect, this is really a critical. But when we just, you know, this is a part of of a cash sum. So if we added uh, funding for Waikato tourism to Eyesight, what would that total come up to? Uh, probably just over, it'd be over a million. Over so it'll be one point one or one point two yeah. million. And then the second part of the question is, I guess. Um, it would be fair to say that there are a number of facilities we fund directly which are part of the tourist package. Yeah, so Hamilton Gardens, mm. Museum, um, Zoo, yeah. uh, Claudelands for visit, visitation to the city. So um, we've got stadiums which attract visitors from outside, so there's a whole suite of things, and even probably including some of our parks. I acknowledge Sean Murray at present cannot be here, and you're in the hot seat, obviously, but. I'm just interested under um, the uh, 27 around the, the issue of synergy and um, the top of page 123 there would be a sustained level of service with an eyesight available to service visitor information needs in the city. There is a potential for the museum site to support CBD vibrancy, good parking, car and coach, public transport, possibly lower foot traffic opportunities at this point. Um, and then there was a talk about either the Waikato Museum or site, which obviously will, which will, or the the gardens. Can you perhaps give a breakdown on that? I, I'm, I'm really trying to, because the point of the question is, I'm wondering if in the long term future, with the development of the theatre river plan, all of that in that area. In fact, I, interestingly, the. Uh, museum site may be just as relevant as, as the current garden place site. 
Uh, well, there's significant activation down mm. there, and in mm. a number of our other plans, such as the river plan, obviously there's a new jetty going in below the museum, which mm. um, the River Explorer will be taking people to and from mm. the gardens. Um, and, and then the discussion with council has been about how do we link that as well. Uh, just just one example is with the um, the Michael Parakofi, uh, uh um, statue there mm. that's actually uh, generated a lot more activity down mm. just in front of the museum and arts post. Um, Shree's team have noticed that it's had um, we've had some increase in visitation to both arts post and uh, the museum. Some of our mm. surveying is showing that that um, uh, tongue of the dogs actually attracted that. Um, so, so there's a number of things going yeah. on in that precinct where um, you know there's there's high activation and the activation's increasing. Once you get the theatre in there and some of the discussions we've had, and eventually link VOTR up to the theatre to through to the river paths and opening up the back of the museum, then there'll probably be even more activation in that space. Notwithstanding the fact that there's, you know, potential for a hotel in that precinct at some stage as okay. well. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. I just want to follow on from Councillor Mallet's questioning around paragraph 36. If I look at um, paragraph 49, which shows there the financial model and the current model for 1718 suggests that there's a deficit of 445,000. I assume uh, that they are the direct costs of running EyeSight and that the overheads that are mentioned in paragraph 36, which would be in that vicinity of 294, is in addition to that 445? That's how I read it, Councillor. Yeah. Rob. Okay. Okay. So, so what happens? And I think you might have partially already answered this. If we were to close the eyesight down or were to uh, shrink its activity size, what happens to those stranded overheads? Do they eventually disappear because we don't need the staff and the overhead within the overhead of the organisation to support it, or do, does it eventually end up? just simply being reallocated amongst other parts of council? From, from day one, those stranded overheads would stay. But as, yep. as we move through a complete review of what's driving those overheads, there will be things like um, support staff that yep. we may not need, um, say, one person to support eyesight, and so that would be that a saving. person would get reallocated, reallocated or go somewhere else. Yep. Well, there may be contracts in place that provide services to eyesight that need to uh, run its course over the next nine months, for example, yeah, okay. and so it would stay for that long. So my, my gut feel on stranded overheads is that we do whatever we could to reduce those, but ASAP, but yep. you, would, you would see that being reduced based on what's driving those costs. Yep. But in the short term, while the cost remains there, it, it simply gets reallocated across the rest of the organisation. Yes. Yeah, okay. Right, thank you for that. Um, question on paragraph 6, uh, which talks about um, eyesights around the country um, being managed by incorporated societies trusts or through regional tourism organisations. Is anyone able to answer where uh, regional tourist organisations might manage eyesights? I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I was wondering if Hayley could... No? OK. No? So we can't answer that question? No. no so no, I was just no. looking to see yeah. some how, of the, how the model would some work. Some of the staff are going to support me out here at the moment. They're coming, but yeah. I think they're coming okay. from Claudelands, which is a bit of a challenge. So. OK, OK. Because my next question is really around paragraphs 9 and 10, and that is wondering why we're getting pushback from Hamilton Waikato Tourism that they don't want to be involved in assisting us with the management of eyesight. And I say this, you know, and, I, and I'll leave some of this for the debate, obviously, but we're paying $580,000 a year for them to manage tourism in this area, hell of a lot more than what the other councils are paying, and, um, and we're getting pushback from them to say that's not our core business. Um, anyway, th this is more debate than question, and if there's no one who can answer my question, then perhaps... But there are, there's different models, and it's a bit like regional sports trusts, too. There's different models. Some regional sports yeah. trusts run facilities, some, some don't. 
it's they, they see that they just program things and actually get people active. Um, that's what's happened here. It is it's horses for courses in different regions. That's my understanding. Yep. Um, and Jason's team aren't into running eyesights. They don't run them at um, Huntley or Matamata or any places like that. So they don't see that as their core function. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll save save my comments in for debate. Thank you. Um, I am in the events that the amendment and the motion are lost, I'm foreshadowing a further amendment. That will be that eyesight is closed and a tourist information centre is run through the Hamilton City Council reception and that the permanent eyesight staff will be reta retained and deployed throughout the organisation. So I'm just flagging that that's, um, there is a, Foreshadowed amendment. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. On page 121, paragraph 6, tells us how many sites there are around this, the uh, region. It says, uh, the last sentence says, the Waikato region has a total of 17 eye sites. Is that, that, so that's someone's, that's obviously accurate, I assume. No, it's not. So 17 eye sites is not right. It's not. I presume it's accurate. Like I just, I just, I just find it very, very strange that there's 17 eyesights in Some Waikato. Some places like Waikato District have them in more than one town. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that, that, then that's not the Waikato region, so that's not 17. Anyway, and I, I just wonder if anyone can tell me um, why is it expected that they will reduce that number will reduce. Uh, other councils are reviewing. Whether they have them or not, the one at Huntley, one at Huntley, my understanding, it was in the local newspapers, is closing soon. Okay. And I suspect that's due to the when the expressway opens, that they won't get as much traffic. Okay. So, okay, so they they're facing reality. Okay. Um, page 124. Um, paragraph 40. One, uh, 41, I think it must be. I've got a little note over there. Yeah, page 41. Uh, something I've just found, uh, I didn't, I've never heard of a visitor destinations unit. And I've just seen it here, so thank you very much for that visibility. Um, it's just what a do they do? It's just a clustering of Hamilton Gardens, the museum, and um, uh, the zoo in, in my group. So, so it's actually. Okay, so what, what's that unit do? What, what, what is the budget for that unit? It's the budget of those three. Yeah, how much is it? Three facilities. Um, off the top of my head, uh, probably close to eight million dollars. Eight million dollars per annum. Yeah. How many staff in there? Probably 150, 100, 120. So, so what? So, so are they the, the staff at the zoo? The staff at the Gary, zoo, the staff at the mu me. museum, and the staff Where's at the garden. of this? I'm trying to find out what this cost us. Why, why was it in the report? It's in the report. So I'm asking, the I, I want to find out how much we are paying for tourism. Because one of the things, because we're told that eyesight is a very valuable thing because it improve, create, creates tourism for the city, I want to find out how much tourism costs us. So, so is that the staff at the zoo, the staff at the um, gardens, yeah, gardens the, the three, the three facilities and the that are mentioned? the commensurate over, uh, overheads for those three facilities. Yeah. Okay, you've got a stab what that's costing us. Sorry, the have overheads. You, got, you want to take a stab at what those three facilities I, I, are costing? I don't us? have that off the top of my head. What the overheads are? No, no, sorry, you, you said eighteen million before. Didn't no, you? Eight. Eight million bigger, but yeah. that's for the, that's the cost of those three facilities. The direct net operational costs are around that figure. I couldn't tell you what the indirect op, um, overhead costs are. Okay, is there okay? So, is there any reason why it wouldn't be similar to the ratio of overheads to actual costs for eyesight? Because their overheads would appear to be half of their half of their costs. I, I I can't ask that off answer that off the top of my head. One would assume so. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, I just want to talk about um, page 125, um, the staff feedback. And I do understand that they, they're nervous when, when uh, you know, um, possible um, retrenching and whatever. Um, and, but there's a couple of things that I just want to ask. I mean, I, di I didn't know that the council was a visitor destination. Who, <laughs> how does that fit in with, with, with um, eyesight? Sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, within the visitor destinations area of council, so... Um, Those what are what the paragraph three, are you in? 51, 51, you. sorry. Those paragraph. are the three facilities I talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The gardens, the zoo and the museum. No, oh, <laughs> no Bobby misunderstood. Um, it, it's more about that the council is the visitor destination and or the area of council's visit destination. <coughs> so which visitors besides people that need to use the council come to the council as a destination? No, yeah, this building is a visitor destination or this area. No, this is, doesn't it, what, what it means? Oh, sorry, then I misunderstood the, it. I'm so sorry. The staff structure yeah. where the people lie within the organisational structure. So I have a thing called a community group, and then I have a unit called the Visitor yeah. Destinations yeah, Unit, which has yeah. those three facilities in it. Oh, that's what you're so, meaning so by that. So the eyesight is currently in Sean Murray's group, which is okay. a different group to mine, okay. and, and what's proposed in uh, one of the options there in the recommendations is that then eyesight would be downsized, moved into arts post, which means it transfers from one group of the council to another group, structurally. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Now, the other question is uh, on, for 52. Obviously, if, if it will attract a lot more visitors when it is in, in the arts post, we, we will add more staff to that. It won't stay on the light side, will it? Um, well, the, the staff will be less than what's in the current arts site building now because yeah. it's, it's being downsized, yeah. level of service, and it's actually going to be combined up with Cherie's um, operational team at Arts Post and some of those staff will get additional training as well. Okay, but if you see that there's more traffic happening, you, there will be an increase in staff, I assume. Uh, Possible. Well, Possible. we would have to review that, but yeah. obviously we'd look at efficiencies and, yeah. and we'd review sure. how we're operating and then, you know, and, and if we're overstaffed, then we'd have to address that as well. Sure. So it's just what we do. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Councillor James. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I can't see it here. It might be here, but I'm um, just wondering if there's a... Do they have a visitor count for down there? At Arts Post and the uh, Museum? Yeah, like per, per day? No, oh, down the here. eyesight? Yeah. Uh, I assume they do, yes. But you don't know how many a day, or...? I don't. I don't run it. Unfortunately, I've sort of been thrown in okay. here, and I don't run the facility, So, and the people who are going to support me haven't arrived from Claudelands yet, but <laughs> Sheree can give you um, the... If you want any details around arts, post to the museum around visitor numbers. Yeah, I oh know. I was just, just more um, interested in the eyesight numbers actually, just per day. Um, so I think it's quite hidden at the back here. If it was actually more out front, it, you'd probably get more visitors. But I'm just wondering to know roughly how many a day. That's all. But they can get back I, to me. I can't give you that detail okay, off the top of my right. head. I'm sorry, I don't know that. Councillor Leo. On page 145 of the consultant's report, I notice here each of our contacts is costing us $14.10 per hour, which seems to be way out of kilter to anybody else in the country. When you look at New Plymouth, which has got uh, 5.3 staff, we've got 6.7 staff, which is reasonably close. You know, they do each contact for 5.42. Are you quite satisfied with these figures which we've got here? You know, it's three times uh, the next cheapest one, or the next highest one. So, could you, 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 actually, yeah, could you just repeat that? <laughs> the, the contacts on page 145, each contact we have in the ISO is costing us $14.10. And yet we look at a comparable one, which is uh, New Plymouth, where this is only costing $5.42. Look at our staffing, which is uh, comparable. It just seems to me that it's uh, way out of kilter from everything else around the country. Uh, 
I would, my understanding is it's due to the revenue that's generated yeah. rather than actually the, the cost structure. So as the report says, and the, the report from the consultants is that our eyesight doesn't generate as much revenue as, as other eyesights do. And that's why the cost per visitor is higher. So um, the, the net cost is higher. Um, when I look at the customer contacts, say, per annum, compared to us and Hastings, which is very similar sort of costs. What page are you on? Uh, uh, this is now on page 142. So. We've got the total customer contacts. It just doesn't seem to be right to me. I'm just wondering whether how accurate the report is. Because Hastings is five dollars, what? It's a third of the cost, basically, of what uh, we're getting. Well, it's showing we're sort of one income. of the worst performing eyesights in New Zealand. Sorry? It's showing we're one of the worst performing eyesights yeah, yeah, in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, sure, but it can't be that bad. Sure, it is that bad. That's why it's costing us a million dollars a year. Nine hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah, I'm just a little bit doubtful about the consultant's report, that's all. How much should we pay for the consultant's report? Does $30,000 sound right? Deputy Mayor Martin. I think uh, you have to be careful with the words worth performing because uh, my personal experience is I I've just been blown away with the um, help and, and I've taken travellers in there and it's been fantastic. But I think if I've got this right, really, it's around the revenue. In other centres, you know, just, I'm just trying to get a, a fix on the other revenue streams. Like if you go to Rua to Rua, you buy stuff, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that is revenue generating where perhaps we haven't because of the nature of the Hamilton tourist experience. I'm not sure, you know, when we talk about the cost per person, that is essentially, will that be about tours and things that are sold? Like if I'm in the middle of Queenstown, I'm buying product, if I, if I get that right. I'm just trying to work out that, you know, the, what that actually cost figure actually in reality means. So my understanding is that, um when you talk about those uh, high tourism mm. eyesights, they do a lot more booking of hotels yeah. and um, tours and things yeah. like that, and that's a major part of their business. And they get a they get a commission, they get a cut on yeah. that. So a they've got they've got the foot traffic of people are actually spending, actually using their services to that's book so. things, and that's why their their net their net cost per visitor is less because their revenue is way higher because of the nature of it. Yeah, and, and I acknowledge that you've been put in the hot seat. Sean Murray should be here. It's not his fault because we changed around the agenda. But I think that's, I think that's a reasonable, accurate... Because I'm just saying I'm not sure if we're doing apples with apples because, in summary, what you're saying, Mr Acting Chief Executive, is that this eyesight, correct me if I'm wrong, is a different dynamic to say if I went to Rotor or, or, or Queenstown because they are doing a lot more direct sales of immediate attraction. Absolutely, and that's what the yeah. consultants report, which actually yeah. I've just found out from Sean, who's texted me, was thirty thousand um, dollars, and uh, that's what the uh, consultants reports highlighted. That you know these these are actually different beasts, mm. and in in different areas, so um, need mm. to take that into account, and and and. You know, council's got a number of options that have been explored and outlined in the report, and um, the the lower cost option at uh, at Arts Post, integrated with Shree's team at Arts Post, is is around actually um, lowering that cost per visitor mm. and um, trying to maintain uh, well maintain the service that's provided to visitors to the city. Just moving forward, I mean, for example. The notion that I, which I've done, I, I, I think I go into eyesight by a WOMAD ticket. Thank you very much, like the counter service, but that's kind of not necessarily a core thing. And yet I'm just trying to get the balance if I want to buy a, a Hobbiton or a Waitomo Caves ticket because that's in the region that's benefiting us. And I'm just trying to 
worked through, you know, the breakthrough of, of what is of definite benefit, whereas I could go somewhere else. Well, well Dave Mack would tell me just do it online to do WOMAD and do it properly. But do you see what I mean? I'm just I'm just trying to work at what what is a core activity of an eyesight versus some other stuff. So Haley's the um, Haley's our manager of the yeah, eyesight, sorry, so no. she can probably comment Thank on you. that. Um, so there was a couple of other questions that were raised in terms of our visitor numbers. So each year we're getting about 40,000 mm. visitors through our door and that's through our foot counter stats. Um, in terms of our core services, so basically as an eyesight we're here to provide vouchering for accommodation, activities, tours, which um, has been mentioned previously. Our event ticketing services is an additional service. Right. Um, we're also there to kind of showcase all the other regions throughout our country um, with our brochures, our maps. Um, again, retail for us is, is an additional service. Um, we also do all sorts of reservations, um, transport options, so rail, ferry, bus, taxi, shuttle, um, all sorts of transport, um, accommodation, attractions, activities. So those are eyesight core services. Um, that we must remain if we need the eyesight branding. And so the, through through the chair, obviously, the follow-up question, if you move location mm -hmm. in order to look at some overheads and probably long-term maybe a more a, appropriate site for an eyesight, those core services will remain, obviously. Correct. Because they're required by the eyesight contract. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Tourism Waikato, again, um, given that we give them half a million dollars, what role have they played in giving advice and helpful reflection on this particular exercise? Uh, they've been consulted with and mm. they've, uh, um, they've had input into the consultants' report. Obviously, the consultants have spoke to them. Uh, they, they have a view that um, our eyesight provides benefit um, to visit, vi visitors to the city and um, you know I don't want to speak for Jason but the discussions that Sean and I have had with them that um, they are much in favour of keeping some eyesight operation within Hamilton City itself with um, A what our focus has been going forward and um, B the amount of people actually coming through the Waikato and the growth in tourism and I think the um, uh, Tawaka CEO highlighted some of that in a presentation to a briefing a few weeks ago, just with the the general mm -hmm. increase in tourism across New Zealand, but also just the, with the Waikato region and the um, the different offerings that are happening and the increased offerings. Mm. Can I just come back and I don't know if you can give me you know the forty thousand visitors people come through the door is not insignificant. Is there a sort of a breakdown about those who might be offshore versus domestic tourists versus locals? Is it, you know, you know, it kind of just getting a mix of who comes through? Um, majority of our visitors that come through our door are local visitors, so yeah. therefore the attempt, event ticketing, um, all the event information that we provide, um, our retail as well. So our, our main visitor through the door is, is local. Um, next would be a small percentage of domestic travellers and then international travellers. And in terms of location, I'm just trying to get a feel. You know, obviously we're driven by the need to <coughs> trim budgets and all that. Yet, <coughs> is the location, what are the factors that are critical around a location? Um, I think definitely <coughs> a city centre location. Mm -hmm. Um, most of our travellers will come in through taxis, shuttles, bus, right. um, and when travelling around, majority of people will travel into the city centre hub right. um, to look for information. So definitely location in or around the city centre is quite ideal for, for our travellers. So would, without again asking you a leading question, if you did Excuse Hamilton me, Garden... Me. Could I just interrupt? Oh, yeah. Sure. I'm not comfortable with the manager of eyesight being in the chair answering these questions. Um, the general manager, Sean, who should be here answering his questions, is not available. Irene, who should be here, is not available. No, she's, not She's here, Irene. Sorry. Um, I, I, I well, person, look, don't uh, really think... Uh, the question, at the moment, the, the questions I'm asking, with respect, Your Worship, the questions I'm asking at the moment are... 
with respect seems perfectly within the capacity, you know, because I, I realise the over, an overall view, Sean, yes, but I, I'm assure you I'm just asking specific questions. Well, when we're talking about the performance of eyesight, the location of the eyesight and um, these things, I, I just don't think that we've got the right people in the chair to be answering these, and I'm thinking of putting a procedural motion to put this until these people are, until Sean is in the room. Um, I, 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 Delay their decision. That's what. For, I, that's what. No, not motion. not for this afternoon, but for another meeting. Yeah, that's that. So that's um, what I think. I'll put a procedural motion to put this off to a well, a, a meeting when the um, the general manager is here, who is the appropriate person to be sitting in the chair to be answering these questions. So I'm putting that motion if there is a seconder. Okay, seconded by Councillor Paula. So um, the motion is to um, make this decision at the next council meeting. So um, all those for? Any against? Councillors Mallet and O'Leary against the motion. The motion is carried. And Deputy Mayor um, Gallagher, thank you. Thank you. Yes, certainly. So we'll stop until...